Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hibbert and uh, Dr. Pinda for inviting me to this uh, inaugural session. I want to sincerely give my thanks. The apostles of Johan Marange, uh, from the outset, let me also acknowledge the fact that uh, I was born and bred in this uh, denomination. I left when I was uh, 17 years, slightly 16, 17, that's when my faith started shaking. So I am very close to this denomination. I still have members who are there and you will be hearing this in this paper. Let me give the introduction and uh, methodology. Violence is ubiquitous in Africa taking on different faces, gender-based, political, racial, xenophobic, and religious, to mention a few. Some ultra-conservative Christian denomination constructed doctrines that deny their members the use of Western pharmaceutical drugs and indigenous herbal medicine in favor of holy water, leading to high infant mortality and the death of women during childbirth amongst its members a form of violence. A typical example is the African Apostles of Johan Marange Church in Zimbabwe, AAJMC, an African independent initiated instituted church, AIC, that sponsors charismatic and Pentecostal praxis. The engines behind Christianity's phenomenal growth in Sub-Saharan Africa, the AAJMC is an ultra-conservative group with an estimated 1 million followers in four Southern African countries that teaches against modern healthcare services and indigenous herbs. To mitigate against this is courage. Researchers are recommending several interventions. Maguranyanga argued for educating, informing, information sharing, communicating, and dialoguing. Felotu and Maguranyanga, and I quote, advised against the heavy-handed response in the use of legal actions, end quote. Gerede and others support engaging the government and church leaders, as well as government or law enforcement in social mobilizing communication strategies targeting apostolic communities as possible ways to improve immunization acceptance, end quote. Along the same lines, Museveni found that broad-based interventions led some ultra-conservative Christian groups to accept modern health services gradually. Adding to these noble interventions, this paper argues for a dialogue with the AAJMC leadership and local government agencies aiming at the gradual acceptance of Western medicine since it is enthusiastically embraced Western education, which was considered a sin, quote unquote, 30 years ago. Western education is also slowly leading to an informed interpretation and contextualization of cardinal texts that supposedly deny modern health care services. This intervention is a positive because the AAJMC now accepts and funds Western education a systematic shift in its doctrines. Therefore, the ground is fatal to dialogue for modern health care, including immunization, since some young members of the AAJMC are graduating from institutions of higher education and are covertly embracing Western pharmaceutical drugs. The suggested intervention is a continuation of uh, Danielle's argument that encourages, and I quote, legitimate indigenization or contextualization in which Christian communication is adapted and rendered intelligible without forfeiting crucial scriptural truth, end quote. The dialogue will start with the church, Western educated young members who are slowly accepting the Bible as a divine and human product whose message, if correctly interpreted, transcends culture, which must be contextualized to appropriate the message. 
since the AAJMC uh, has been a research subject for years, I conducted desktop research about the majority, uh, doc the major doctrinal and leadership changes in the past 40 years. I also conducted personal and WhatsApp interviews in Zimbabwe since I was born and raised in this church. I have used the pseudonyms to protect the privacy of these uh, informants. I left the church when I was 16. Therefore, I compared my experiences with the current trends in this church. I still have family and extended family members who worship in this church. This paper is divided into three sections. Section one chronicles the doctrinal changes that have led to some belief changes in the past 60 years since the death of the founder. The second section details, sorry, the second section details the effect of these changes and why the ground is now fatal to advocate for Western pharmaceutical drugs and even indigenous herbs to reduce high infant and maternal mortality. In the last section, I discuss current position of the Bible in the AAJMC, changes in the past 40 years. When Johan Marange Mumberume died in 1963, he was succeeded by his two sons, Eber uh, and Makebo Marange, who did not change the church's foundational doctrines after quelling a leadership tussle with their father's uncle, Simon Mushati. Makebo died in 1977 during Zimbabwe's War of Liberation, and Eber remained the, as the only leader. In response to modernity, which was gripping Rhodesia, Eber slowly allowed members to listen to the radio and tape record the denomination's music, which was the major form of entertainment. But watching TV shows and bioscope movies was not allowed. And let me quote here Arnold Gambe. Those were the years when the Holy Spirit was still operating. We had to confess if one watched a TV show or even news, Wes was attending a bioscope, end quote. The use of deodorants and bathing soaps with the sand was a sin. Formal education for the boy child was allowed up to grade five, but some boys finished the primary education, uh, which is standard six, which later became grade seven. The majority of girls were not given the pri that privilege, although a few could attain three or four years of primary education. In the mid 1970s, some members started attending the theological education by extension, Fambi Zano classes championed by Martinez El Daniel, which ended in 1982, but the church never joined the association. It was, however, the death of April in 1992 that brought major changes in the AAJMC, which this paper argues will gradually change the denomination's belief towards biomedicine. Noah Taguta, Ebro's cousin brother, became the leader of the main faction after defeating Clemens Momberume, Joan Marange's eldest surviving child, in a leadership battle that spilled into civil courts. Taguta formally accepted Western education in his church, which I argue will gradually change the church's position towards Western biomedicine and pharmaceutical drugs and even indigenous herbs. Western education will slowly erode members' belief in treating every illness, malady, and disease with holy water, the quintessential mark of the church's health delivery system. This agrees with Musewenzi's argument, and I quote, the hegemony and the presumed superiority of the Joan Marangi Apostolic Church belief beliefs and doctrine have uh, succumbed to the impact and the pressures of the demands of the contemporary modernizing and changing world, end quote. For example, the church has constructed three schools in the past 10 years, Senoa College in Bochamarange, which is located close to the church's head office. The school has been described by Motsi as a small, let me quote, as a small England in the middle of nowhere, if not a small university, end quote. The church has also constructed two other primary schools, St. Noah II and St. Zachariah. Early this year, the church laid the foundation of St. Ebro Primary School in Wondevary, where it has a considerable following. Western education was anathema 40 years ago, with my parents demon being demonized for allowing us to finish primary education. The acceptance of Western education is, therefore, a harbinger of more incredible churches in the AAJMC.
the impact of Western education on the apostles of Marange's church. Some boys and girls from AAJMC are now attending primary, secondary, and even tertiary schools. One young man from my village is studying radio radiology at the University of Zimbabwe. The late Luke uh, Masamvu, who died this year, had, and let me quote, 79 children. Nine of his children obtained degrees at different universities. In 2020, a total of 10 were at universities. In the same year, four of his children were doing both O and A level. Form three had uh, three students, form twos, form ones, while 25 of them were primary, were in primary level. One of his children, Mike Masamvu, was one of the best all-level students in Zimbabwe. He scored 19 A's and a B in the 2019 ZIMSEC uh, all-level examinations. Mike's other siblings, Kenneth, wrote 15 subjects and obtained nine A's and six B's. Well, another one, Kelvin, wrote 10 and passed six subjects, end quote. Although this is not a representative of every AAJMC family, there has been a shift in doctrines and practice that can be attributed to the acceptance of Western education. Since its genesis, the church had allowed polygamy and sanctions the marriage of underage girls. This inequity changed, the, changed in the past six years, and some credit this to the young educated members. According to, let me quote here Murapi, David Maboreke, these educated young men and women in our church are now bringing new ideas into the church, um, sorry, into the church, this inequity, sorry, Sorry for that. These educated young men and women in our church are now bringing new ideas into the church, which are slowly being accepted by the high priest Noah. For example, the problem of marrying underage girls, end quote. But I think we need also to give credit to non-governmental organization and law enforcement agencies. At every Sabbath meeting, one of the congregational leaders, usually an evangelist, reads the headlines. A a message from the high priest, which has six points. It is more like a riot act. Your children should remain, number one, your children should remain as faithful members of the church. Number two, you should love one another. Number three, you should correct each other in the church. Number four, no marriage with underage girls. Uh, the church will not rescue offenders. Number five, no members should be involved in politics. Number six, you should not use WhatsApp or Facebook unless it is a requirement at one's uh, workplace. The encouragement of children to remain in the church is germane to this paper's argument. If these remain faithful and acquire Western education, they become change agents in the AAJMC. Gerede and others found that some members of the apostolic community suggested engaging church leaders as an intervention strategy for accepting Western health system. However, Gerede also found that members trusted a nurse or health worker as an information source rather than a church leader. The assessment showed opportunities for continued health education about the benefits of vaccination. This paper suggested that if the young men and women from the AAJ who are training in health related fields remain faithful in their church, they will become sources of information on health issues to their fellow church members. Moreover, some of them are slowly filling junior leadership positions and their influence will cascade down the leading to members to ac uh, accepting pharmaceutical drugs. Dozo and others found that, and I quote, the general assertion that apostolic sex refuse health care is incorrect. Quite the opposite, the desire for good health and survival of members and infants is evident. When the AAJ started in uh, uh, 1932, it did not accept health uh, care because it was an African church started by an African for Africans. Its main objective was to satisfy the needs of indigenous Africans. The fruits of Western education are slowly eroding that uh, founding ethos. Hence Museveni's argument that many church members now simply believe and practice two virtually exclusive belief and doctrinal systems, one for the church with 
some aspects of the system not being followed in the other for the modern health system premised on belief and behavior change. This has resulted in the dual doctrinal system being followed by Joanne Marange apostolic group members. Although modernity, NGOs, and the government of Zimbabwe deserve credit, Western education is the underlying current, with some of the Western educated members of the AAJ espousing a different understanding of the Bible when compared to the founding fathers the position of the Bible in this church. Since inception, the apostles of, of Marange viewed the Bible as a divine document that dropped from heaven and imitatory hermeneutics reigned supreme. Converts were taught to observe dietary laws in Leviticus 11 and in Western medicine, uh, indigenous herbs, paraphernalia for magic, witchcraft, and sorcery was banned before baptism, imitating the episode in Acts 19.19. They were taught that when one gets sick, they should consult church leaders who will lay their hands on them in obedience to Mark 16.18 and James 5.13. Although these are still central scriptures to teach catchmen, some members no longer believe in the literal interpretation. Two informants, John Botto, a retired biology and chemistry teacher, and Peter Mbure, an accountant and a 2016 graduate of Midland State University, no longer accept the A.A. James imitatory hermeneutics. James Botto, I think James, sorry, John Botto, I, he, I caught him here. I think James is not denying the use of pharmaceutical drugs by aging Christians to ask for church leaders to pray for them when they are sick. On the contrary, he is advocating for the use of medicine, wine. Those days, wine was used as a medicine. So I think today we should not use pharmaceutical, we should also use pharmaceutical drugs to cure ailments. Some church members are practicing that in private for fear of victimization, said Mboto. Along the same lines, Mubure said, and I quote, although I did not do religious studies at university, I'm convinced that those scriptures do not teach against going to hospital. I read from an authoritative source that look, the writer of the gospel of Luke and Acts of Apostles was a medical doctor. Now, if God allowed a medical doctor to write part of the Bible, surely he is not against the use of medicine, but medicine does not cure every disease like quote unquote, rich boy, diseases related to us as indigenous African people. While still discussing with Mboto, he intrigued me by reading Sarah, chapter 38, verses one through seven. I will read part of it. Honor physicians for their services, for the Lord created them, for their gift of healing comes from the most high and they are rewarded by the king. Mboto believes in the books of the Apocrypha, which he argues were the lost books of the Bible that were found in the mid 1970s, a common belief amongst the apostles of Marange. The first edition of the Shona Bible with Apocrypha was printed in 1979 in then Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. He therefore argues strongly for the use of a healthy of the healthy delivery system, although some church leaders will not accept this uh, passage from the Apocrypha since it contradicts the Holy Spirit inspired the teaching of the founder, Joan Marange. But to believe the church will eventually accept the biomedicine, but it will not be in the next few years. Let me here give you a brief history of uh, uh, the AAJ's founder. Muchabai wa Mumberume was the founder of the church. He took his mother's last name since his father was from Mozambique. Mozambique, uh, Mumberume worshipped with the American Methodist, now United Methodist Church. Legend has it that he started receiving the Holy Spirit in 1917 when he was barely five years old. On July 17, 1932, his church started after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Mount Nengwe when he was only 21 years old. The Holy Spirit allegedly gave him the name Johann the Baptist. He was commissioned to preach the gospel throughout Africa, observe the Sabbath, never drink alcoholic beverages or smoke tobacco. He baptized his parents and the close family members, forming the nucleus of his church, which observes Pent, quote unquote, Pat Pentecost, the Holy Eucharist on the 17th of July, annually. 
Mboto believes the church will gradually, if not eventually, accept a biomedicine, but it will not be in the next few years. Although Mboto and Mure, who are well educated and members of this church, cannot be used as representatives of all the apostles of Marange, their reasoning resonates with this paper's argument that Western education enlightens their church members. Accordingly, the young educated members are open to a hermeneutical model that accepts the Bible as God's word which does not deny the use of Western medicine. However, there is need for caution because currently it is difficult to be accepted back into the apostles of Marange after receiving biomedicine or spiritual healing from any other African initiated church, especially the Joan Masowe group. Magurenyanga lists more than 10 branches of this group. Gambe said, and I quote, oh, it is easier to be forgiven by the high priest for going to the hospital, but very difficult for accepting the services of the Matsubaba group, Joanne Masowe. By visiting Matsubaba, you are saying the apostles of Marange are nothing. This sin is not easily forgiven. He gave an example of two ladies who gave birth through cesarean operation, but are now struggling to be accepted back into the church. Therefore, in as much as this paper is arguing that since the AAJ has accepted Western education, which is softening the apostles of Marangi's teaching towards biomedicine, the high priest, Noata Guta, is not yet fully convinced that Western medicine works. Conclusion. This paper is centered. Uh, this paper is centered on the African Apostles of Marange Church in AIC, which started in Zimbabwe in 1932, with a current membership of over one million scattered in four countries, Democratic Republic of Congo, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. It teaches against biomedicine, indigenous drugs, and Western education, especially for girls. Most boys will quit schooling when they could read the Bible in vernacular. All diseases were allegedly cured through the laying on of hands, uh, Mark, using Mark chapter number 16, verse number 16, and the use of holy water, leading to high infant mortality, and many a woman died during delivery. But in the past 20 years, the church has enthusiastically embraced Western education. It constructed the three primary and secondary schools with a fourth one currently under construction. St. Noah College, the church's flagship, has state-of-art buildings. Some church members have graduated from universities with a degree in health science and biomedicine, slowly eroding the church's teaching on biomedicine. This paper argues for dialoguing as an intervention strategy with some of the enlightened, i.e. well-educated, Western-educated young members of the AAJMC who are now holding few influential positions in the church. It will gradually lead to the acceptance of Western health delivery system, including vaccination, since some caregivers are overtly, uh, covertly using Western medicine. Although some of my informants are teachers, an accountant, university students, an engineer, journeymen, diesel mechanics, boiler makers, plumbers, and printers, printers. We do not know how many of these educated young people are still faithful in the AAJMC. This is an area that needs further studying. Thank you. Let's thank Paul. Yeah, uh, that uh, that is a fascinating uh, contribution. I have uh, enjoyed reading reading this paper and and now hearing you uh, deliver it. Uh, please uh, send in your questions in the chat box, and I will uh, I'll help uh, us keep track of them. Uh, but let me start out. Ah, uh, let me start out by asking, I, is, is the leadership of the church really ignorant of the changes that are happening? I mean, so often I feel like if, if a church starts to feel like their young people 
especially, uh, are, are moving too far beyond the bounds of accepted doctrine, they'll start to, to pull back and restrict, restrict things. But, but that doesn't sound like it's happening. You've got young people in that church who are studying, who are studying Western medicine. How, how is that acceptable? Does the leadership see the trajectory? Thank you very much for the question. That's a very uh, good question. Let me point you, like I said, uh, for example, this young man who is studying radiography at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, he is my neighbor in my village back in Zimbabwe where I was born and bred. He is accepted and the view is these are our young men who are studying, but you see they are studying medicine, but they don't use medicine. They are good people. But ironically, they are using it partially like what Museveni has researched and what I have found. They accept the tenets of education. They, they accept medicine. So in a way, the leaders, most of them, particularly if I can give example of uh, the leader himself, a high priest, Noah Aguda, they are not educated, the majority of them. Very few finished grade seven. Like I said, I was raised there. My parents were demonized for allowing my brother and I to finish uh, grade seven. So in a way, they are not educated. Although there are changes here and there, it's going to take some time, but I am arguing gradually it is only Western education which is, uh, which is going to help. So the trajectory is very clear, but it's somehow a little bit of a problem in the future. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, that's, that's helpful. Uh, we've we've got some good comments rolling in. Uh, one question from uh, Brandon Hurlbert that if he uh, if he doesn't mind, I think I'll expand it a little bit. Is the is the AAJMC and and perhaps you can reflect more broadly on um, on the issue of African initiated churches as a whole. Are they viewed positively? and or are they viewed as mainstream in their communities or are they seen as a fringe or Christian group or as a, as a sect or as a cult? Um, so specifically for the apostles and, and, and I would ask the question broadly of, of AIC churches generally. Thank you. Um, two outstanding people who have done uh, research in this area uh, Dr. Martinez Daniel, I think he's uh, pretty old at uh, Boston University, although he was born and bred in Zimbabwe. Then Suntulika, I always struggle to pronounce his name. Initially, when the AICs were starting, they were looked at as sex, they were looked at as uh, uh, non Christian, but uh, Things changed in the mid, I would argue mid 80s, 1980, somewhere there, and they started accepting them as a Christian organization with a few who deny, uh, they call them messianic groups, which they say the founder is looked at as a messiah and he replaces Jesus Christ. Those are the few and they are very few. The majority are now accepted as uh, uh, churches and some have joined the World Council of Churches. However, uh, when you are looking at their acceptance, it depends who is uh, looking at them. From an indigenous African point of view, the majority of Africans accept them for one major reason. They handle some spiritual forces which quote unquote Western medicine at times struggles to work with. For example, the issue of avenging spirits when uh, you someone kills someone, then the spirit of that person for some unknown reason destroys the, the murderer's family. 
And these AI, sorry, AICs, they're very good at intervening in those areas. For that reason, you can see some people coming from mainstream churches joining them for those particular reasons. But then there is this aspect of like Western medicine and education, which they don't accept. That's where people run away from them. But they are generally accepted depending on whom you are talking to and where they. And mind you, they have a big following. In Kenya, uh, they even have an organization which is called, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Organization of African Initiated Churches. It's headquartered in, uh, in Nairobi and is very popular because it has these people. So they are somehow accepted, but depending on who looks, who views them and who is looking at them. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, uh, a question here from, from Siobhan, uh, who says, uh, thanks for a really interesting paper. Uh, could, could you say some more about the power dynamics between the church leaders and the local government that you just sort of touched on early in the, in the narrative? Yes. The, in the case of Zimbabwe, where this church is very strong, when they gather on the 17th of July every year, even last year in the midst of uh, the pandemic, they gathered. The government uh, simply kept quiet. They allowed them to gather. And last year, they had a, no, the, their lowest attendance, I'm told it was about, excuse me, 20,000 people. Usually, they average about 100,000 people when they gather for the Holy Eucharist on the 17th of July. 100,000. Martinez, Daniel, and I have witnessed that. I was there in 2016. They got, the government is uh, reluctant to enforce the use of medicine on these particular people. Particularly, that's what M7 and others have argued for. The reason is, it's a major political base. Two of our presidents, the late President Mugabe and the current president have gone there to address them to looking for a political base to get votes. And once the, uh, the leader, like Noah Daguta says, vote for the ruling party, that's what everybody is going to do. So they know very well they're going to get probably in Zimbabwe alone, they, they estimate that probably there is more than half a million people who are members of that church, adults. So if you're going to get those votes, you are close to what you need. So that's the point. And although the government is trying to say uh, you should use Western medicine, but they are also afraid to infringe the uh, power base as far as politics is concerned. I don't know if I've answered the question. That, uh, that That's very helpful. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <sighs> Helen asks uh, a question that uh, that was sort of rolling around in my mind. Uh, you you commented uh, especially about the, these women who had had cesarean sections. You you've talked about the the high infant mortality rate, and so she's wondering uh, if there are any gender differences in the attitudes of the of the members. Um, uh, about Western medicine, are the women more in favor? Thank you. Um, I think it's Biri uh, who has researched a little bit into that area, and she has found that uh, women particularly in uh, Zimbabwe, I cannot generalize every in Zimbabwe, generally are the caregivers. And because of their position, they usually go out and seek uh, Western medicine in private or vet covertly because they are afraid of the male leadership. So for example, 
uh, when uh, this, these women who had uh, cesarean section, when they are in labor and they have uh, stayed there for a day or two struggling, they finally say, please take me to the, what, to the hospital. And at the end of the day, people succumb, but uh, it's difficult to go back to the church. Like this lady whom I know, she, uh, she had two cesarean section and it's difficult for her to rejoin the, what, you know, the church, yet the husband is forcing. So women, because of that, they favor uh, the use of what you know, Western medicine. The same thing with um, uh, uh, the use of, uh, uh, sorry, I'm losing the word here. The, the use of uh, health and delivery system. The women will do that in private to the extent that some go during the night and the research has done that, Museveni has found that some go during the night, some go during the um, evenings, some go even very early in the morning to get health services. They make arrangement with nurses and they do that because they are afraid. So women definitely, I, I don't want to use this word, but probably that they are on the receiving end and they are really feeling the brand of it. Because at the end, men, because they practice uh, polygamy. So if a woman loses a child, the husband say, don't worry, we'll have another one, baby, because he has probably four or five wives. So it's not a problem, but for the, for the wife, is the only baby who has died. So women are really suffering on the side of what, you know, this thing. Ironically, there are also few of them get going into higher education because although they are now accepting Western education, women are still on the lower side of receiving Western education. And open, let me tell you, with the education, it opens, Western education, it opens a lot of uh, eyebrows. Wow. And, and so as kind of a follow-up question to that, um, what does exclusion from the church look like uh, functionally? And perhaps if you can answer it briefly, what does restoration uh, require? Uh, thank you for that question. When I was working on this, I also said this is probably another paper which I should work on, on what it means on exclusion and inclusion. This comes from um, uh, we as uh, indigenous African. Let me use myself as an example. When my mother died, and my father died, I was not yet married and I was no longer a member of that church because I had started going to a Bible school. I was training to become a preacher. And I was asking, are you coming back to the church? Because we want everybody to be back in the church. My father is no longer there, no longer there and my mother. But as an African, you don't have a time when you say you don't have a father. This is my, these are my uncles and my aunts who will take over as my father and my mother. And I can't do most of my major things without them. For example, I can't get married without my uncles doing the Lobora thing, going to take the wife and all that stuff. So if you are excluded now from the church by your relatives, it means your, not, not, your major activities are not going to take place. When you want to get married, who is going to help you to get married, to do the formalities? When you die, even when you die, you have to have a mother who is going to stand for you. And if you have been excluded, what does that mean? So you are ostracized. You are no longer part of the society. You are no longer part of the family. And because you are no longer part of the family, you are on your own. So you try to come back and come, unless you have been enlightened, like what I did. I stood up and I said to my relatives, I am not coming back, but I will remain respecting you as my fathers and my mothers, but I'm not coming back to this church. And they will accept you. And I'm called a rebel, a heathen, a non-Christian. You, know, you are useless, you don't follow us but they accept me here and there when I come. So that's the whole thing. Readmission then brings you this, this you are back into the family, into the fold, into your clan, into your tribe. You are accepted now. But I think that's a very good area. Thanks a lot for asking that. I'm going to do further research on that one. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. That, uh, yeah, uh, I, I so appreciate your, your passion and, and your, um, your willingness to talk about these issues, honestly. I, I, I can say as, as someone who's been um, a bit of a fish out of water um, uh, occasionally uh, teach, uh, teaching at the school where, where Paul serves, I, I benefited so much from him and from his wife and their wisdom in um, communicating well or at least not communicating badly. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for, for what you've offered us today. Uh, let's thank Paul and we'll move on. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so we, we, come, we come to our second paper and uh, the, the, the Center for the Study of Bible and Violence uh, studies both um, uh, the uh, violent texts in scripture and the use of the Bible in a violent world. And uh, we, we've just heard a paper that looks at the second of those really. And, and now we come to a paper that looks at the first. And uh, I, I love the diversity there. Uh, our, our second paper is presented to us by Dr. Ludovic Sutton, uh, who is senior lecturer in Old Testament at the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of the Free State in South Africa. He received his PhD from the University of Pretoria in 2015 with the thesis, uh, A Trilogy of War and Renewed Honor, Psalms 108, 109, and 110 as a literary composition. Uh, he serves as a reverend in the Dutch Reformed Church and has done work in Bible translation. And his paper today for us is entitled, Honor Through Violence and Justice, Perspectives from Psalm 58. Uh, Ludovic, I, I turn our time over to you now. Thank you, uh, uh, Ashley. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, the sound is uh, fine and that you can hear me. Uh, can I just quickly share my screen then with you as well? Uh, uh, is it possible just to enable that for me? 